On today's show, I'm excited to talk to legendary producer, composer, arranger, and keyboardist Ronnie King. We talked to Ronnie about how he got started in music, his work with hip-hop legend Tupac Shakur, working with popular punk bands such as The Offspring, artists such as Mariah Carey, Snoop Dogg, his great insights into the music industry, and much, much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the premier music interview show where we talk to the best musicians in the world, including Grammy artists, Emmy artists, Tony Award winners, Pulitzer Prize recipients, Fulbright scholars, and many, many more. I am absolutely delighted to introduce my guest today, legendary producer, composer, arranger, and musician, Ronnie King. He has worked with artists such as Mariah Carey, Tyrese, Tupac Shakur, Snoop Dogg, The Offspring. Spring, Pepper, and Rancid, and many, many more. He's been known for his Moog keyboard and Hammond organ, a sound that has been sampled and copied countless times in hip-hop and popular music. He has worked on records that have sold millions of units. Ronnie, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Well, Ronnie, you've worked with some really multi-million selling acts and bands and artists. I want to take it a little bit back to the beginning, and I know you've probably answered this quite a few times. Um, I know you come from a very, very musical family. I mean, all the way stretching back to your grandfather, right? Sure, sure, that's right. Yeah, they came, um, they came from the Dust Bowl era here in the United States, which was a, um, a, a farm, kind of like the early farm laborers, you know? And they all came from... Um, uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma coming to the West Coast to uh, find money really was was the thing. And they uh, they would pick during the day and then during the weekends they would play the uh, weekend barn dances, you know. And your grandfather, Henry King, he lived to 100 years old. Is that is that right? He sure did. It was all that hard labor and good living. And, and I know the music and he had a big family. I think they had 12, 12 people in the 10 kids. And, and I, I think just all that, you know, all that pure living and, and all that love and whatnot, really, he was a uh, fan and played the banjo up until he was a hundred years old and he had no hearing, but he could still play. It was pretty interesting. Now, in a lot of interviews that I've seen with you, you touched on this a little bit, but I actually want to go a little bit more in depth into your training. Now, you mentioned that you played the piano and you did choir. Let, let's go back a little bit more in detail. So at what age did you really start music lessons? Well, since I'm at the bottom of seven kids in my family, uh, my oldest sister was like 16 or 17 by the time I was born. So, I mean, immediate, by the time I was five, they were teaching me piano and we had a very musical family. So we had every instrument under the sun there. And so I kind of went through the lineup of instruments and each one of us kids would pick a different instrument. And I just kind of latched on to the piano was kind of, uh, my thing. And so my, sister started teaching me piano at five and she had a friend and my brother had a couple friends that were very prolific at playing the piano classically and jazz as well. One was John Bacino who became a, uh, uh, a, a partner to Stephen Sondheim in New York. And they did a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the Broadway shows and all that. And then Scott Smith, who's become a great instructor of uh, jazz piano. And so I, man, I was in the right company. That was for sure. Can I ask you a question? Do you have perfect pitch? I do not have perfect pitch. Or very trained relative pitch, I guess. I Yeah, it's relative pitch. Exactly. Perfect pitch is where they can just play a note. and But I'm kind of like more visual with my tone anyway. Um, so I kind of, I, I, I hear notes, but I see them on a chart, basically on the music chart, uh, just because of my training or whatever, um, with improvisation and also with theory. So I, that's kind of how I think of music in a way I hear music and then I, 
in my mind, I guess I put it on paper. So you're able to relate the music theoretically relative to the key and harmonies. And so that's quite a bit of training. Is that, did you learn that from yeah. your family, the, the theory? Because most kids, when they take lessons, they just read and then they reproduce what they read and, and they, that, that's pretty much it. Yeah. But you, you seem to have a, a really deep understanding of how music functionally works. Yeah, I think early on they they had uh, my ear training was pretty extensive, and then getting to a level of of reading, um, it just sort of played into it a little better. My piano teachers used to really get mad at me because I, I would go, "Hey, play play this sheet," you know, like play <laughs> this sheet of music for me, and I'd kind of look at it and I'd kind of listen to it. And then I'd go back and kind of just by ear, I guess, in a weird way, be able to replay it. And they're like, you're not reading the music. I said, how do you know? <laughs> well, because you're kind of skipping over some stuff, but you're close, you know. So, you know, close, close is good, you know. Did anybody mentor you? Were your family members, were they all theoretically based? Did they all know, like, how music worked and it was uh, all just common they, knowledge? That, yeah, they were good readers and that's why I got into reading music at an early age and then when I went to uh, college and kind of a funny thing when I was in high school Berkeley Theory Berkeley School of Music brought a extension to a college here in in the Palm Springs area and so I went through my my training with Berkeley while I was in high school because nobody wanted to take the class it was kind of a new thing and I was in high school and they were just like, you know what? You should be taking this class. So they sponsored me to do the whole program. Wow, that's great. Berkeley, by the way, I'm also an alumni. What's that? I, I went to Berkeley too. In tw- I graduated oh, yeah. 2012, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I didn't exactly get to go to the college because they had this extension here at a college where I was. But the theory and the jazz theory was was from Berkeley. So the the ear training and whatnot and the reading. And then I was still pretty much doing classical for a couple of years when I went to a college and then I was kind of done with it. My teacher said, uh, Hey man, look, you're really good. You're not made up for the LA symphony. You, you might as well go into, you know, another part of the industry. And I said, well, that was the biggest relief ever because I hated having to be so structured, you know. Which is ironic because I, I believe you would have liked to hang out with Bach and Beethoven. Those guys, they could improvise too. Uh, very imp- exactly. They were very improvisational. And I love Ravel. And a lot of jazz guys really got me into Ravel because he was very spirited in his his approach to music no i wanted to actually ask you did you have a mentor of any kind i know you have a musical family but was there somebody out of the family who kind of took you under their wing and kind of gave you advice and trained you gave you you know that kind of thing uh early early on like i say it was john bacino and um and scott smith they were the two guys that when i was really young they were like hey this kid's got a gift and and then I studied with the, the jazz. I studied with Scott Smith more. He was a very, very interesting character when it came to uh, jazz improvisation. And then uh, John Bacino was more into the songwriting aspect of it. Loved the Beatles and loved the structure of writing songs. And that's why he went into the... Uh, you know, into that field of writing songs for the uh, Broadway shows and more like that. So I kind of had it, had them both. And I would say they would be the the mentoring factor. And then uh, in my classical years, uh, Virginia Waring, who was a uh, wife to a gentleman named Fred Waring, used to have a lot of uh, piano competitions and stuff. And so that was a real challenge to try to be at that real serious classical level. But like I say, I kind of, I would always get there. And then I'm like, this is a little too structured for me. I need to be a little more freer in my expression. And then, um, so that was it. I kind of had like three, three different kinds of areas that kind of rounded me out, I guess. And that's, 
why I was able to go into Hollywood and uh, get involved with the, the early days of sampling and all that stuff. Cause I could literally just sit there, listen to the song once and then replay the thing, you know? You worked with Timmy T on his number one hit, right? Uh, one more try. <laughs> were you touring with him, or were you? Yeah, I the, toured. Or were you? Did you play on that record? I didn't play on one more try. He actually did that himself in his garage for eight hundred dollars, and it became a number one hit wow. in the country. Absolutely amazing. And at that point, my management and stuff said, "Look, man, you you don't need all." You, Everybody, you don't need all this crazy stuff, man. Just write a great song. How did he go from the garage to number one on Billboard? How does that work? Well, he was from Bakersfield, and there was a couple of people coming from Bakersfield. Of course, in California, the, uh, Bakersfield was a big country songwriting mecca for, you know, Tom Petty and, and Buck Owens and... Um, uh, the few other artists were coming from there. So that area had a lot of songwriting kind of lineage there. And he was just sitting in his thing. And then he came to LA uh, probably. And just, I mean, when I met him, he was under management with Maury Alexander who ended up uh, managing me. And that's how I got in contact with Timmy and Timmy needed a, you know, someone that could uh, organize his, I guess they would call it a, uh, a music supervisor. Oh, of like some a sort. music director kind of thing? Or a music director for his live shows. And then we recorded a bunch of records. I, I can't exactly remember all the songs, but I, I didn't do the hits with him. But um, that was really fun because it was another kind of analytical thing was I'm like, how did this dude record and make this song? You know, and it really, it really pushed me to go, you know what, you don't have, it's, it's just a thing. You know, you always talk about that it factor and he definitely had it. There was no doubt about it. And it was, it was a great time in my early career for sure. Any uh, interesting anecdote from that tour or touring with him? Well, the best part of that tour was I was, I was living in an apartment in, uh, in the hood over in, uh, Fairfax and Venice Boulevard, which was, uh. You know, it wasn't in Hollywood. There was nothing glamorous about it. I'd moved from the desert and just got an apartment with my brother down there. And uh, the best thing was when the tour bus rolled up to this, you know, not so great area and, you know, just a little apartment. I went, wow, OK, that's fun. <laughs> you know, that was fun. And at the same time, you know. Being in L.A. at that particular time and being with the people I was with, you know, a lot of people were were, were in the Compton and Watts and, and, and uh, you know, kind of uh, West L.A. type of world. And uh, so I thought that was the coolest thing, man, seeing that tour bus show up. And and then we toured probably, I don't know, for a year and a half pretty pretty strongly. And at that same time, we'd put a recording studio on the bus and it just started the whole you know it started the whole this thing yeah it was pretty fun now how did you get into the world of hip-hop now that's and i guess that was a very important time in hip-hop and tupac and johnny J, and they were very seminal figures in that field but prior to meeting them and and that were you exposed to hip-hop before and did you have any experience with that i you know, I was always into funk, you know, I was always into funk music. I had a bot. My first keyboard was a Fender Rhodes and a mini Moog. So that was like kind of the tools for funk music at the time. And I had this equipment. And um, so I met a gentleman named Richie Rich, who was with a group called the L.A. Dream Team. And they had a big song called, uh, I don't know, I just remember, The Roof, The Roof, The Roof is on fire. Come on, everybody. <laughs> and then he's like, man, he goes, I'm at the studio every day, and there's nobody that can, like, replay samples, and everybody's just kind of using, it was phasing into drum machines and production-oriented stuff. And he goes, hey, I want to take you up to Jerry Heller's office and see if there's a place up there for you to to spread your wings and um went up there and jerry goes oh my god this guy is perfect for what you know for what the process needed at the time and 
LA was just the hotbed for gangster rap music. And so when I started, I started with uh, Tony G and Julio G. Um, uh, that was the early days for me. Mellow Man Ace, uh, Kid Frost, you know, all of the the East you know, Chicano rap, Spanglish music. And I just, that's exactly what I did. I'd go in there and they would say, Hey man, then they started calling me like the frosting. Oh man, put the frosting on it, you know, which would be added musical parts to, you know, enhance these sort of primitive samples, I guess, but they were so cool. The samples were so cool, but technology was like filling up the sonic space, you know, and, in uh, uh the music and uh and then we were changing really like you say it was a very important time in hip-hop because we changed the way records were made from the east coast because they love east coast sampling 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 and then we brought it over here and then we started replaying the samples changing it flipping it we would call it we would take the sample and then we would just flip it and like Take this sample and reverse everything. So you would transcribe. So you'd grab, like you'd listen to the record. You could transcribe it and just play it back. Pain, right. And, and then you could modify the because you knew theory, you knew harmony. You could do things, right? That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. And then still keep the still keep the feel. So it wasn't the one thing I think is I don't know a strong po- point of my uh, talent that I've been gifted with is. To not be stiff or sterile, you know, Um, you can be very technical and very accurate, but sterile, you know, because it's uh, kind of two different brains, you know, but for some reason I kind of had them both going and then just hanging out with real great producers like Battle Cat and Fred Reck and, and these guys were just street guys and they always used to look at me like, how did you do that? You know, and then they're like, well, whatever you just did, that was great and we're on, you know. Now with hip hop, there's definitely a lot of wonderful rhythms there, a lot of interesting syncopation, but were there any trained musicians who knew theory and harmony in that community at that time? It was all heart, man, you know. I mean, rap music comes from the heart. There wasn't a lot of people getting, you know, educated, you know. It was just like, get a drum machine, get a sample. In the early days, I mean, the sampling was just so primitive, but they would make it work, you know. And then, no, there wasn't the no. I mean, there was guys like Scott Storch, who became a huge producer, who was, I think, more trained. But he was from the East Coast as well. And you had a good friend, Johnny J, right, who who I, I was reading his biography and he had almost a full ride scholarship to Berkeley that he turned down. There were more and more great musical people starting to enter into the industry as well. Yeah, Johnny, Johnny was a real special person um, because he was just, I don't know, his ears were so knowledgeable of the sonic structure of music. You know, he spent eons and years just studying mu you know analyzing music and beats and tones and and that's where he was brilliant you know and then he would say hey put the put the spice on this and i would come with a thing and he'd be like let's just take that let's just <laughs> bump that up a bit or let's you know he was so good at that did he play piano and- or were you his piano guy I was his piano guy. He was a drum programmer and right. producer. At that's time right. To... The SP-1200, right? The drum machine. That's correct. And it was funny because that was a 16-bit sampler, which was in today's world is very archaic. But it was very warm and it was a very part of just that genre and that time for us, you know. And he was a genius at the SP-1200, you know. And then later on, they came out with a you know, a, a MPC 2000, which had more sampling time, had a little different tone to it. And then <clears throat> then guys kind of went that way with it. But Johnny just stayed in his lane. And that's what Tupac really loved about him. Because uh, Tupac didn't like a lot of music on his, when he was rapping, you know, he would always be like, just give me a, we'd go in there and make a beat for 30 minutes. He'd show up, go in there, knock his music, you know, rap, his raps out two or three times, and he's like, "I'm out." 
you guys fix it up. You guys figure it out. And, you know, the rest is kind of history. But he was definitely musical, right? He he definitely was very attuned to to listening to what you guys were coming up with and could tell what he liked and what he didn't like. Uh, yeah, and he loved Johnny's drum programming, you know, because Johnny was just so in-depth and, like I say, so much music of of the funk era because that's kind of where we came from from that g funk all came from the early 70 funk bands originally and then uh, johnny was able to take it and make it his own and that was that's how it all kind of started with Pac. so anyways there was a lot of guys kind of doing it but johnny definitely had his own style and then when the hits started happening it was just like okay that's our style we're gonna stick to that and and like i say kind of the rest is history after that I want to get a sense of the of the musical climate at the time. Were people starting to move away from funk, and they wanted they wanted to s- break things down a little bit and not get not get too many parts in music and strip it down and get it more raw? Is that what was? It was. It was take and it was taking the rawness of the seventies funk music and putting it on the sampler. That's where the sampling, that's where the whole thing started was sampling and DJs would have their turntables and they would take the sounds literally off the turntable and put it on the sampler. I mean, it's kind of the same thing we do now, but the technology wasn't as, you know, developed basically. So you had very short sampling times and you had to be real creative on how you would get all that information into those uh, early drum machines you know you mentioned that when you were working with tupac you said we used to write eight songs a day describe a typical day where you're writing eight songs what does that look like well i'd come in with johnny and there would be an engineer there and uh we would sit there and johnny would call in other musicians maybe to play the bass or Played the guitar. Ricky Rouse played a lot of guitars. Greg Dalton played guitars. Um, Cornelius Mims, who played on, you know, these are all really, they played on a lot of records, these guys. So he'd kind of combust us and get us all in the studio. And we would sit there, I don't know, these guys didn't like to start early. So we'd probably start about <laughs> three in the afternoon. Okay. <laughs> And kind of get, you know, kind of get warm, go through a couple different styles of tracks. Maybe by six, we would have like, you know, three or four tracks done. And then Pac would show up like after dinner and go till, you know, two or three in the morning. And we would just have all these songs kind of developed. And he would be, hey, I like that one. I don't like that one. Uh, I'm going to take 30 minutes, you know, make me something else. And then we would go in there and basically just structure a song and then he would come in and go, man, I'm digging that one or, or whatever he would be feeling. So we did so many songs in a day. And then Pac was so fluent, of course, with his vocals and what he wanted to say. So was he a virtuoso? Was he in the sense that he was creating on the spot and rapid fire? Yeah. Yeah. He was a poet, man. There was no doubt about it. I mean, he was, you know, and we all know that. I mean, they have college courses on, you know, the real depth of where he was, but he was so knowledgeable about social things and, and had a lot to, to pick from. And he knew who he was and he knew what he wanted to, to uh, you know, express. So he could come in there, hear the song, he'd go, oh man, yeah, this is a, this is a cruising track, you know, or yeah, man, this is a sad track, or this is a let's go to the club track. And then he would just accordingly do his thing according to how he felt about those songs. And 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 history says, yeah, we were doing eight songs. And there's so many songs that aren't even out that we did. I mean, we would we did this for years, you know? <laughs> wow. So you're saying there's plenty of posthumous stuff yet to be released. There's so much music in those catalogs, man. It's just like, it's, yeah, and Johnny's catalog. And then, and then the stuff that Johnny and I would be doing, you know, even outside of Death Row. I mean, we'd go back to the house and keep recording, you know. It was just kind of one of those things. You, 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 didn't, want the, you didn't want the party to stop, you know. You wanted to keep recording. Describe your keyboard playing. What was your thinking creatively? Let's, now, you were saying you were coming up with these parts. Uh, if you could get a bit technical with me now. So... How would you think musically in that in that situation? You're de- you're dealing with hip hop. 
What are the characteristics of your keyboard parts? Well, for me, like I say, it's kind of about the tools, you know. So we love the Fender Rhodes. We love the Mini Moog. It was very integral in the sound making, the Sonics. Um, we, we went in and got this Kurzweil 2600 that had like a really great piano and strings. And it was just kind of different than what everybody else was using at the time. Everybody was into this product, uh, Roland or Korg. And I had just, I don't know, I acquired a, a Kurzweil, which was a German made keyboard that was, you know, very popular, uh, you know, in, in the European states or you know down there and uh i started putting it on there and it just m made so much sonic sense with johnny's drum beat so what you're saying ronnie is that the technology was really informing the playing in a sense yeah agreed now the harmony and the melodic content was that informed by the funk and your the music of the time as well yeah, kind of with all that, it, a lot of that sometimes came from us just sitting there and, and Johnny going, hey, listen to this song. What are they, you know, what are they doing on this song? I'd be like, oh, that's, oh, that's a Fender Rhodes or that's a, that's a Moog and this is the sound. And I just go, you know, he'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's the sound, you know. Did you play with L. DeBarge? I played with DeBarge. I, uh, L was not in the group. He did a couple shows with us. Um, I played with Marty and James. I toured with them for, I don't know, a couple years. And that was pretty fan. Those, those boys are very gifted. Uh, they're, they're, they're aliens, man. <laughs> I mean, the way they play the keyboards, I'm like, how did you do that? They just had a a feel that was uniquely their own, you know. Now, is that around a similar time frame? Or is that a little bit later? Yeah, around the same time, yeah. You also worked with Snoop Dogg as well. Could you talk about your work with Snoop Dogg? Oh, yeah. Well, that was that was kind of an easier one, I guess. Uh, being at Death Row, you know, everybody from Dre, every Dre, I mean, everybody was there. And um, basically, I was, I was very exclusive to Johnny J and Tupac. I didn't really go out into any of the other studios and play or whatever um just because we were so busy with the tupac stuff um so all those guys were always around and then um a producer called me fred Reck, who was producing for snoop and is actually on his martha stewart tv show fred's been with snoop for a very long time and he just he said man you know come because I know your style would be so great on this record with Snoop. So I showed up to the, uh, just showed up to the studio, really. <laughs> and they're like, this is Ron King. And everybody's like, yeah, we know who he is. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and and uh, walked in and said my piece. How you doing? How you doing? And just got to work. And, and uh, yeah, it was cool. I mean, Snoop is very easy. He's, he's exactly like you see him, man. He's a... <laughs> Easy going guy. How is he different from uh, Tupac then in working with him? What are the differences? Well, like I say, he's very easy going. Very easy going. Uh, very much. You know what the interesting thing is? And I think I said it before. As an artist, they know who they are. That's the easiest way I can put it to in kind of layman's terms or, or in a way that's very understandable. They know who they are and they know what they are and they know where they want to be. So Snoop, he was always, he's, he's exactly like the dude you see. He's just chill, loves to kick back, very loose. You know, Pac was a little different. Pac was very political. There was a little different energy going on there, you know, and Tupac was a teacher. He was an educator. So all the guys that would come up under him, like the outlaws, and I mean, they were getting an education in the studio. They had a little bit more aggressive kind of teacher going on. And, and Snoop wasn't really trying to teach anybody anything. He was just, this is me. Make me a great track. I'm going to get on it. I'm just easy going, you know? You mentioned DeBarge. You've also played with some superstars, uh, Mariah Carey. D yeah, describe your work with Mariah. Well, she once again was 
she knows who she is. She knows what she is. She knows her abilities. Um, she was fantastic. Uh, we just sat down. I sat down with a producer, Damian Young, and um, I brought my Moog in, and that's what I brought. And then they had a, usually studios had a lot of equipment there. So, but I had my kind of special, I don't know, this particular Moog that I had just. I don't know. It just had a sound that worked on a lot of records. And so I would just use that superstitiously, I guess. And um, I walked in and she was very polite and very nice. And so nice to meet you and and uh, relaxed. And she goes, here's the song. And she's sitting at the board and she pushes play. And there must have been 150 tracks of vocals, man. <laughs> <laughs> like. I'm like, whoa, that was big. Because with DeBarge, it's so funny. I had, they wanted me to produce some music with them. So they came in. And at the time, uh, the studio I was at only had a 24 track reel to reel because we were on reel to reel at that time. And, and, and James DeBarge looks at me and goes, man, we can do this, but dude, don't ever call me again unless you got 48 tracks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I looked like, what? He's wow. like, come on. Like, we can't do it with 24. He's like, that's not really how we get down, man. I need 48. <laughs> uh, I need, you know. That's a and lot that of was tracks. way before the coach was hey, So Mariah must have had, I don't know how many strung up together. Uh, and, and um, yeah, she turned that thing on. I went, whoa, that was big. And she goes, hey, I want to put the Moog right here i'm like okay and she goes and she started singing this melody right i'm like okay and and my little analytical mind's like okay and then and then the process probably took no more than five minutes which would be about two times through the song oh, which song is this ronnie you, which track is this uh, it's on Rainbow. It's called Cry Baby. Actually, Snoop is on it as well. Okay. Yeah, so it's like an R&B, of course, type of track. And um, yeah, and I just went in there, put three or four boot parts on and some Fender Rhodes, and, and that was it. But she had it so tight and so together, and she was so nice. I mean, she knows what she's doing, and I think... The big celebrities that I've worked with, uh, they all know what they're doing. I work with a lot of up and comers and they don't really know what they, you know, they know they want to get there, but they, they've missed one component and that's like, know what you're doing, you know, at least be the best you, you can be at least. Right. You, you mentioned that Mariah, she knew exactly what she was doing and she was very in control of the overall sound. That's refreshing because you can get artists who are just, you know, they don't want anything to do with that, the production side. But it kind of affects the overall production if you don't have any real understanding of your vision and what you want to do with it. it does. She, she sets the tone and there's no doubt that with her, it's a little more in detailed, like maybe DeBarge is more in detail because they're singers. So they have a lot of tracks that they got to put on and they have to be at that time. They didn't have like all the technology we had. So they had to be really good. I mean, they had to be exceptionally good. And I think a lot of records of the early days before all that vocal technology came in, uh, they had to just be a little bit better than everybody else. I think a lot of bit better, really. And we, like you said, a word before these were very important artists of that time they were setting the pace for the rest of the industry to follow not only the production value but also the uh, attention to detail you know and to be able to pull that off live and and do all these different things you know but she was very much in control uh, great time. I've seen her a few times since then. I have a lot of friends working with her now on her live show in Vegas. And, you know, it just, um, it was really just a treat to uh, play on such a uh, monumental record, I guess, you know. Now, at the same time, well, in the 90s, you were also having a very lucrative and successful punk career. You worked with major punk bands at the time, Offspring, Rancid. So yeah. could you talk a little bit, how did you also get into punk almost two 
they seem like diametrically opposed, but not really, because they do have similarities in a sense, but sound-wise they're different. So how did you get into punk at the same time? Well, that was an interesting thing. When I was on tour with Timmy T, <clears throat> my, uh, my stage manager and roadie said, man, you got to get out of this hip-hop thing you're in. It's never going to go anywhere. And I've got this <laughs> Jack Grisham from TSOL who makes a lot of records. And I said, okay, well, I didn't, didn't know much about it. And so he gave me the, the song, uh, the record that they did. And there was some sampling, a little bit. He was trying to change from music, from the punk rock scene just being a uh, guitar-driven thing to having samples and some keyboards. So I went to the audition and I had all the samples ready. We played that thing, played the songs, and I was, you know, like I say, you have to kind of know who you are, why you're there, make it happen, hit the mark. And so I saw the marks and then Jack's like, you're my guy. I need a guy like you in my life. And um, <laughs> we, ended up, we ended up writing music in Hollywood for, I don't know, about four years. And what we would do is, and that in those beautiful days, you would get signed to a record deal. And so they would say, here's a crazy amount of money. Go in, show us what kind of record you're going to make, and then we'll decide whether we're going to pick you up or not in 30 days. Well, a lot of the record companies, but they'd give you this crazy amount of money to go in and do that, right? So we, we had a producer, Julian Raymond, who's fantastically huge now in the country music scene. And uh, we would go and we would get these deals and our attorney would make the deals. And we probably walked from four or five record companies because they only had 30 days to either sign us for like a million bucks or not. And so a lot of times that, you know, a lot of times people would get fired within those times. The climate change, this would change. And so they would go, well, yeah, OK, we gave you this amount of money and we're we're not going to have you. So we would just go to another record company. Well. We were sitting there on a major deal and he goes, we're Jack goes, we're going to quit doing all of that. And we're going to go with Epitaph Records, which was Brett Gerwitz, who was the producer of The Offspring. Uh, the record label was one of the first independent record companies that were really making a huge mark on music. And uh, everybody was on the label. The Offspring was there, no effects, Pennywise, Adolescents, the Vandals. I mean, the entire, really, West Coast punk music scene was on that label. So we signed a three-year, five-year deal with, with Epitaph. And just from being around, uh, you know, you befriend a lot of the people and Brian Holland came to me one day and said, Hey man, we want you to start recording records with us. And so we recorded a bunch of songs together and, and a couple of them made the cut. No, wait a second. So there's something interesting. Now you play, you play keyboards. Now that is not normally associated with punk music, right? You mentioned you would have to change things in your playing to make it work. And you, you did make it work. Yes. So one of the first songs I did with the Offspring was called Hit That. It became a pretty big, I don't know, multi-million selling record. And and uh, Brian, we'd sit there in the studio. He goes, dude, I want you to do that Dr. Dre stuff on this record. I'm like, <laughs> how am I going to do that? I mean, it's not even the same. Dude, you can do it. You, you'll you figure it out. So we sat there. And um, I forget who the producer was. Could have been Tom Wilson or Bob Rock, one Is of them. Is it Brendan O'Brien? It, it was Brendan O'Brien. That's exactly right. Uh-huh. Right. Right. And, uh, yeah. And so we just sat there and we went through it and he's like, put some clavinet keyboard on it. Like he was really pushing <laughs> me to go outside my realm. And that's Brian Holland. He's the outside dude, obviously. Uh, and he's, he's a biochem major from USC. So he right. told me one time how he would write songs, he would do it like a bio songs and sounds and just like any other producer would do, you know, and or songwriter or whatever. And that was the start of that. And he's like, dude, you got to go on tour with us. And then that was like, he was like, I toured with him for, I don't know, eight years or so. At the same time, I would, I'd go on tour, I'd come back, go to death row. And really in the same day, 
I would just studio hop. I'd go from a Tupac session to an offspring session and then no effects would call me. Hey, can you fly up here tomorrow to San Francisco? I'm like, eh, I'm open. And then fly, you know, just, it was an amazing time in music. Uh, not because the finances were there and everybody was doing good in those genres, but it was just, uh, it just happened to be that time for everybody before the digital age started, you know? Now, here's a question I have. How did these California punk bands, what were they doing that revived punk in the 90s? Now, this is a genre that's actually much older. How did they rejuvenate that genre? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say that they were very informed about wh- where the history of punk came from. So they... They studied and really got under their skin what the, the, the angst or the, you know, the condition of what made punk rock punk rock. And then we were kind of into pop music. So then it kind of that's how the genre of punk pop kind of came in because it got real poppy. It got real pop like radio type, you know, because the Sex Pistols and all those guys, they were on the radio. But Epitaph really had a genre of, of, of music that, I don't know, with Bad Religion kind of led the way, I think, a lot. Uh, the Vandals. And, and so the energy of the punk was there. But then the, um, the pop music and the studio levels. And then you get these big producers in there. And they're all doing pop records and big records. So they kind of combined all that into one song you know basically were you familiar with punk from the 70s yourself i got into that with jack grisham definitely he really schooled me on a lot of bands like the damned and the bands that he liked that had a lot of key because there was a lot of keyboards in early punk i mean blondie and and the ramones maybe not so much but there was a lot of bands out there that had keyboards in it nobody kind of realized that but there was a lot going on there um in the early days and then all that kind of went popular with blondie i mean she started as straight punk you know kind of in a way and then moved into like a popular kind of started using hip-hop producers and you know all that started working and then so it just kind of kept going you know kept developing and then on the west coast we just kind of followed suit and uh started making these pop punk songs you know with the keyboards were all in there sometimes they're so in there you don't even know it's a you know i used to put like a lot of fuzz on the keyboards and tried to make it sonically fit inside where the guitars were you know and then um and then the piano stuff was was real big with like the damned and and the strings were definitely in there and we had always just manipulate it so it would wouldn't overtake the guitars but it would definitely enhance the bigness of it you know ronnie i want to ask you a couple of quick fun questions now that i always like to ask guests and just you know you can give me quick answers or you can take your time with them what were your top three hip-hop records that you worked on Oh, geez, the hip hop. Some of them never came out. I mean, working with Richie Rich, I had worked with so many artists like King T, working with Battle Cat was surely a highlight. Some of the records never even saw the light of day, but just being in that deep trenched genre, um, working with, with Easy Lee, the producer of Cool Mo D was a highlight, uh, which some of that music never came out. So you got to figure out of the hundred songs you would make in that genre, maybe five would actually see the light of day. You know what I mean? So, you know, of course, working with Tupac, my favorite, um, Snoop, of course, is a fave. Um, I worked with, uh, Craig Mack out of New York. That was really cool. That was really fun. Um, I guess those would be the three. Working with Busy Bone from Bowden Thugs and Harmony was amazing. And uh, even working with Mark Wahlberg was pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. How, how do you, you know? guys work together? We worked together on some soundtracks. Um, he was just getting into his acting career. And I think, geez, I'm forgetting the name of the movie. 
The big hit, Boogie Nights, Traveler. Big hit. That's what it was, the big hit. All right. <laughs> Wasn't that Wesley Snipes? No. But we were doing so many we were doing so many soundtracks. I the first soundtrack I ever did was with Kid Frost on uh, on the Crow soundtrack with Mr. Mix from Two Live Crew, the producer. That was a pretty fun one. And then Coolio, we had a soundtrack. We did uh, Nothing to Lose on that one. Um, we did uh, um, American Me with Kid Frost was really fun soundtrack. And these were, you know, what's so funny is because all these things became classics. You know, it's like weird, but they were such a time, such a time. Uh, and I do remember the song I did with Mark Wahlberg called Don't Sleep. And he kind of looked at us and goes, I'm, I'm going to hang up my rap and shoes. I don't think he's rapped ever since. <laughs> no, no let's make last Mark Wahlberg rap song. Oh, by the way, before we move on from hip hop, are there recordings of hip hop that perhaps you were not involved in that you really you admire? Um, <clears throat> God, I used to listen to Brand Nubian. Um, I love the East Coast hip hop a lot. I love Run DMC, which I worked on a record not long ago, about two years ago, with Exodus and Run DM with uh, with uh, Daryl from DMC. That was an interesting record as well. Um, I loved Run DMC. I loved uh, Brand Nubian. I loved the East Coast stuff. It just seemed to be really, you know. What are the big differences between West Coast and East Coast? Well, I think the East Coast had more sampling, less live playing. And then when, you know, then when the West Coast got a hold of it, we're like, hey, man, we can put real basses and real keyboards. And, you know, we started putting a lot of music like Puff Daddy. I mean, some of those early Puff Daddy songs were just all samples, you know. Let's move on to punk now. So top three punk recordings that you worked on. Oh, that, I, well, you know, of course, The Offspring was great. I loved working with No Effects. Okay, with The Offspring, give me three tracks that you really are special to you. Oh, that I was on? Well, Hit That was really special. Um, and then there was a song on Conspiracy of One... And then I we we did a record I don't know about three years ago maybe called Days Gone By I think was the name of the album and the track name was um God I don't even remember the track name Sorry All I Have Left Is You O C Guns Dirty Magic O C Guns Okay <laughs> O C Guns That was a fun That was another one of those Hey Make It Sound Like Dre type of thing You know it was right. just like such a wild <laughs> combination everything but you know i love uh, in my punk world i just love the vandals and i love all the epitaph bands that you know i love performing and, and playing with pennywise and you know those are kind of just embedded in me i guess but i really do appreciate jack grisham for turning me on to some real different kind of punk rock music like the damned and all that really helped me out quite a bit and and trying to find my voice inside of, of punk music. Now, you're a really eclectic musician and producer because you're very well known for punk and hip-hop, but you've produced classical recordings too, is that right? Yeah, and I'm doing more. That's, that's, my, new, uh, that's my new thing that I'll be doing. That's so full circle, right? You, when you were studying as a child. Yeah, it's really fun. We are now working on kind of the Ronnie King. We'll just... For an easy name, it'll be Ronnie King and Friends, let's just say. And it's like all of my big artists that I've ever worked with, I'm going to take their biggest songs and make them into symphonic songs, but yet also combine the, the real elements of where it came from. So like with The Offspring, maybe I'll do Come Out and Play and do it in an orchestra kind of a way and, and just kind of kind of bring those songs into where I feel, where I'm at. You know, I, I, I work with the uh, Seattle Symphony. I've got a symphony out of Kiev that are going to be doing a lot of my work now. And I really just, if you can look at the vision of the black grand piano with the orchestra, and then the singers will be the actual singers. You know, if you could get Mariah on there, if you, you know, Snoop, have him come up and sing in front of an orchestra. And really bring it to kind of that genre. I just went and saw Andre Bocelli and he does that a lot. 
uh, because of his producer, David Foster, who I kind of am really in tune with right now, where he does that quite a bit. Uh, so uh, that's just kind of my new thing. But everybody's like, man, you're the best guy to do it because you have all that range with it and you would be able to really. So everybody's on board. So. We're really excited. I've written some songs for the new record. Now, do you do the orchestration as well with the orchestra? Yeah. Uh-huh. I sure do. Let me ask you a technical question. Do you use that pencil and paper or do you use some finale nah. or Dorico or something? Uh, yeah, I just I just play it on the keyboards. I actually use Logic, uh, which is a program that notates pretty well. And uh, I just play the parts and then uh, it just prints it out. And then sometimes you got to go back and fix notation and whatnot. But um, yeah, no, I do it. All, we do it on the computers these days. It's just so much. It's so much more hands on. Uh, <clears throat> the, the lost art of writing definitely is something I used to love to do. But, yeah, now when you get <laughs> a little further on time, all you have is time. Right. So if you're. They're going, man, am I really going to sit here for a day and write this out when I can really do it in an hour and have it printed, you know? Now, one thing that I, I think is the same way that you took the keyboard and made it work for punk, I'm sure you're always thinking about how you arrange these things so that they work. That's the most important thing, right? Like, you seem to have this ability to make things musically make sense. Is, is that something you can constantly consider? I do. I'm I'm definitely an arranger. So I'm definitely when even when I write or when I start a new song or something like that, I'm always kind of thinking about the arrangement and how, you know, how the music plays through the whole song, you know, before I even get into the details of the chords and the and the lyrics, the arrangement of it, which is Hey, sometimes you want to start with uh, the strings or sometimes you want to start out with the vocal, you know, however, whatever the, the mechanism may be. Or maybe it's a, my big thing now is I'm like really back into the grand piano. So most of the songs that I'm venturing in, you can kind of think it more like Coldplay, you know, where they're very keyboard piano oriented in their music, right? Um, Keen, I love that band from, from England. And it's so funny because the English bands have really, since they are from more of a classical, you know, oriented world, you know, their music kind of comes out that way. So yes, it'll be very piano and string oriented and, and the piano will definitely play a big part in it. And I think that's why a lot of the artists that'll have on my record are very excited for it because they're like, dude, that's you. That's, that's, that's where you, that's where you come from. And we're so happy that you're going to do it because we're in for it. You know, when it comes to punk and hip hop, I notice heart really is a, a, a factor that really is, makes them both related in my mind. There's a lot of heart in both of those genres. Now that's important, right? To you. And you, you really want music to have heart. Could you talk about how that influences your compositions? Yeah, you know, I always said punk punk rock and 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 rap and hip hop were basically just different sides of the same coin. They were both kind of like outcast type of music, you know, and then it became popularized. So the way I kind of see, you know, music is like you got to come from that place of the the origins of the music so even like classical music i mean i'm i'm hopefully i can educate symphonies to play with more heart and when you've got a hundred people that you're trying to conduct and you're trying to you know convey a message to you kind of got to be pretty clear about it and i always i would I played with this some of the seattle symphony guys not long ago three or four months ago and and i was just like yeah man just just have fun with it and let it go. You're not under the gun. Nobody's going to, you know what I mean? And just by giving people the platform to be themselves and to be free in their music. Wow, man. When they started playing the strings like that, I was like, that's cool. That's exactly. And you kind of help people motivate into the, 
the genre, I guess, or the experience, you know. Now, you also wrote, did you write a book on your experiences? We're writing right now. Yeah, we're writing right now. It's called Punks and Thugs. Talk about the book and when will we be able to read the book? Well, I'm doing all of my, you know, talking on the little microphone and telling the stories. And then when I go see my buddies around, I say, hey, you remember this story? And so I'm combi- compiling all of the funny stories kind of behind the scenes of how this music was made, kind of like what we're talking about, you know, uh, the conversations between Brian Holland and I from The Offspring or the conversations between Fat Mike or or the conversations with uh, Battle Cat or, you know, it's like the funny s- stuff, you know, that would kind of like, wow, you remember that? And, and they totally remember it. And we all just kind of like it all kind of comes back. So it's sort of a a behind the scenes look into punk and uh, rap music of when I came up, you know, in the nineties, basically. And uh, it, a lot of the people are not around anymore. So it's kind of like, I may have to convey their stories a bit, um, you know, cause they're just, they're not around anymore. So I get to kind of tell maybe a voice for some of our, fallen brothers that are not here and i think that'll be really cool and then also to kind of just convey the message that you can be in all this different kind of music if you just kind of just be nice and be cool and 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 don't we call it social climbing you know don't don't be all about the end result and getting the money and the fame and the thing but really be there present with with which which is happening at the moment you know and um, the symphonic part's going to be a part of it because, you know, making this new record, and it'll probably come about the same time, and it'll be this next year after January, to bring the book out and then to bring the new record out. It'll really coincide with kind of my whole journey and, and where I'm going further. You know, I'm loving the movies, soundtracks I'm doing. I mean, I'm just so... I don't know. I'm really excited about the new page, you know, and I think that's a big part of music, too, is you have to reinvent yourself and find new uh, find new loves, you know, for music just to keep your music alive, you know, and to keep what's in your heart going and, and to have the uh, what we call the connectivity like anybody who's going to be on my record is going to be a platinum selling or more artist. Right. So it'll be a Reese or the outlaws, I'd love to have them on it. I'd love to have Kid Frost and Mellow Man. And just, I think if I can achieve that, then I think not only would it be a, a good, uh, a, a phenomenal record for a lot of people, but it would also be something that could be uh, profitable for today. And I think it could see the light of day because within the business, you know, it takes money to get this stuff out to the public and it's a world music. I have Ravano from two unlimited is going to be on the record, you know, and they did remember that song. Y'all ready for this? Dun, 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 dun. Can you imagine that song or something like it in a symphonic, but still funky and dance and man, it's just, it's, it's such a huge vision. I, I don't think, and I don't think a lot of people have done it. We've seen it like on the Grammy awards with, you know, Metallica doing, you know, the, their songs with the orchestra and, and there's been bits of it. And I know I just heard in a, a, a record from Ibiza from uh, Peter Tong, who's kind of like the godfather of Ibiza you know, dance music. They they had a thing where they did all of his hit songs with the orchestra. And it's really cool, man. It's really... So it's not necessarily new, but I'm just going to give it a new look and a new voice, you know? Let's end off with one final question, which is, what advice could you give to an up-and-coming producer or musician who perhaps wants to make it in this industry? Yeah, well, it's a different industry than when I started, no doubt, and it's a different industry than when Jerry Heller started, and uh, and when you know, she the fifties or when Elvis started. It's a different world. So today's world is really, I think, one: will the music last past 
this year. So you take a lot of these artists, right, that are playing and they're really making a great impression on uh, the kids. And I think um, that that the music we're going, we're moving so fast and our attention spans are very short. And, you know, but I've been so, I don't know, excited about the records I've done. They're 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 classic records. It's almost like working with with with. Uh, Smokey Robinson or working with Elvis. I mean, these records will be around forever. I don't know if Little Yachty's going to be around forever. I'd like for him to be, but I just think that for artists coming up in today's music, try to really make music that will span the test of time. And only time kind of knows that, you know. But also, at at the same time, you know, you've got two parts to it. You got the businessman part of it, and then you got your artist part of it. And you're like, hey, man, I'm an artist. I'm going to do my thing, and that's the way I'm going to do it. And that's just the way it is. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, great, or whatever. And if that's your case, awesome. Make music just for yourself. And if it hits and people want to finance it and they want to be about it and all that stuff, that's absolutely fantastic. But what I find is a lot of new artists, they want to make a career. They want to have a nice car. They want to have, they want to have a life, a financial life, right? So, you know, take the page out of all the way the music business is going, how people are like really able to navigate the music to where it needs to go. You know, um, like I talked about the Ibiza music scene. I mean, Nobody really knew that scene was going to be as hot as it is, but it's hot. So they were doing it for the reasons of, hey, we want to show people how cool it is out on this island in the middle of Spain, you know, and it became popular. And, the, and then, you know, these D DJs are having a very nice lifestyle, right? So I would say for the new artist, one don't social climb so much. Don't try to already be done with it and have the money in the bank and have the roles. And, and when you do get the money, the money leaves real quick. And if you want to see a really great movie on just that one thing, look at the Scott Storch new kind of documentary they're doing about him. This guy was worth $170 million, had yachts and everything and lost it all, you know, just because. Well, just because the music business changed, the royalties weren't coming in the same way. They weren't paying him $150,000 a track. You know, that's hard to find these days, you know? So don't chase the money, but chase the money. You know, don't, you know, interpret the music the way you want to do it and be that, but don't be so, you know, arrogant or set on that's the way it's going to go down you know what i mean like be real flexible and i think in that artists can have a career in any business i think flexibility right now is important in any kind of intellectual property i think it's important in movies i think it's important in financing i think it's important in the digital streaming world they have to be flexible you know because you know, we don't even want to get into the musical streaming aspect of life. That's that's still not done yet. And there's a lot of people like myself that write music and that make, you know, a living off of our record sales and all this stuff. And we're getting shorted and there's no doubt about it. Everybody knows that I'm not on a soapbox about it, but that has to change, you know, and it has to change within the world scheme of things, you know. So, you know, we have to be aware of what intellectual property is. It's just not us sitting in the studio. Hey, even if we write a song in 15 minutes and it sells, you know, 2 million copies, they're like, well, shoot, well, that doesn't seem like you should get a bunch of money for that. It's like, man, we're, yeah, we should, you know, it's like Timmy, he did his record for 800 bucks, had a number one hit in the country, but what are you going to say? Oh, that's not, you shouldn't get the proceeds from that, you know? So. Just have have fun, but 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 stay focused and and stay aware of of 
where the business is going as well as your creativity. That's all I can say. You know? Well, what can I say? The legendary producer and musician, Ronnie King, thank you for taking some time out of your schedule to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Sharing your wisdom, sharing your experience. I mean, I really hope you'll come back on the show again. And, and I really hope you take, if you can, why don't you come over to Singapore? We would love to have you. And show if you listen, if it's it love. Um, LA, I know LA has nice weather, but Singapore is pretty nice too. So you should consider coming down. I want to. I have a band that I'm producing now, uh, Big Mountain, which is a reggae band from. Oh, they've written so many songs, but they uh, they're out there now. I mean, you guys really get the best music. I mean, you you get a lot of great music. I mean, from around the world. I mean. Everybody wants to come and share the music, um, you know, all through Asia. I mean, David Foster, the guy that I just admire, and he, he I think he's doing, uh, I think he's real strong in the uh, Asia's Got Talent movement, you know, where they're doing, uh, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. And, I mean, the K-pop stuff I've been involved with, I mean, hey, we're in a world market and we should all be together because there's nothing like traveling and seeing how other people live. And it, and it makes a, an effect on you. you and the, if it affects you, it's going to affect your music and uh, it for the world. And, and we really need that in the world right now. We I'm need so to all glad be you together. say that. I'm so glad you say that because yeah. that means we'll have you come over and then we could – we can hang out and you can we can talk music even more. I would love to. I'd love to talk to the kids. I'd love to perform. I'd love to bring bands. I'd love, you know, whatever you, whatever you need, brother. Well, Ronnie, a true legend, fantastic musician, and so much history in his career. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day. You too, my friend. I look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you so much for listening to my interview with the great Ronnie King. It was a blast learning about all his music industry experiences, and I hope you had a great time listening as well. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes so we can get more amazing guests to interview. Thank you again, and I'll see you at the next show.